Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us for our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Welcome. You can make some noise. Amen. Amen. Well, we've been talking about the I am's of Jesus in probably... As I go through and really reflect, I think tonight's is probably the one of the, it's the pinnacle. It's the one that without this one, um, everything crumbles. It's imperative. We talked about, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world, I am the gate, and I am the good shepherd. Tonight we're going to talk about, I am the resurrection and the life. Amen. You know, listening to that, that song, you know, if, if you walked out of the grave, I'm walking too. Amen? So, if there was no resurrection, we'd have a problem there, wouldn't we? Amen? There'd be a big problem, and I think uh, a lot of the way we base the decisions of our life really are, <clears throat> they, they hinge on our understanding that the life that you, we're living here and now is temporal, it's so infinitely small in comparison to eternity that goes on forever. And so we, we miss the, the enormity of understanding that we were eternal beings living uh, here on planet Earth. And as a result, uh, we try to process information based on our worldview and what we understand. Uh, and, and quite frankly, if we don't understand that uh, Jesus came out of the tomb and, and he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. Amen? Amen. All right. We're going to be in John chapter 11. John chapter 11, verse 1 and following says, Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, a village, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary whose brother Lazarus was now lay sick, was the same one who poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters went, sent a word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. When he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her, sister, and, her, and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews were there, they tried to stone you, and yet you are going back? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in daylight? Anyone who walks in the daylight will not stumble, for they see by this world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I am going there to wake him up. His disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he'll get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but his disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. For your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. Then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, let us go, that we may die with him. On his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to, Mary, to Martha and Mary to comfort them in their loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed at home. Lord Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she had said this, she went back to call her sister Mary aside. Teacher, the teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied, and Jesus wept. When the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, this, at this time there is a bad odor, for he has been in there for four days. And Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you have sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out. His hands and his feet were wrapped with strips of linen and cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Well, that's a picture there that's an amazing picture. And you can imagine uh, the, the picture back in the day uh, that when someone would die, they would have professional mourners come. Professional mourners would come, and uh, and they would wail. They would, you know, they would just spill themselves out uh, in grief with the family. Uh, and so these mourners came, and Jesus is looking out. These are his tight people. These are the people that he is uh, that are very close to him. And he sees their condition, and and, and he's understanding. He stayed behind. The scripture says that. When he heard of the grave condition of Lazarus, he stayed for two more days. So by design, he stayed in an order that uh, Lazarus would die. Are you with me? Let that simmer for a minute. So Jesus comes, and his full intention is to show him, show these people... On the front end, before the grave, before Jesus was crucified, to show these people that he had power over the grave. Do you hear what I'm telling you? So, this thing's unfolding, and I've often thought about Jesus in, in the emotion that overtook him. Because when you look at your friends, when you look at your friends and they're hurting deep, uh, naturally it's going to move your heart too, amen? Amen. But, but more than just the, the temporary pain, the, the bigger picture is they had no concept that he could say, Lazarus, come forth. They had no concept that everything that occurred there was by design. 
Everything that Jesus did on this whole journey was by design. It was focused on that there's a point that he entered this world, born of a virgin in a manger, and there was a point that he was going to exit this world, and it was going to be on a cross, and he was going in a tomb, and he had to come out on the third day. And everything on that journey pointed to that cross in that resurrection. In this moment, this moment was painting a picture for them at the cost of their emotion and the pain that they were going to experience. And Jesus looking at them and knowing in advance that how this thing's going to unfold, even as he's crucified and he's in the tomb and he comes out, he knows that their hearts are going to be deeply troubled. And he sees it right there with Lazarus. He weeps. He weeps amongst them. And then he does what only he could do is he commanded life over death. Amen? If we can get the picture of that, and I've often thought about that, uh, Lazarus in the tomb. And he's in there and, and you, hear the, you hear the warning to Jesus, you know what, when you roll that stone away, he's been in there for four days. You hear what I'm telling you? There's going to be a bad odor, Right? You know, it's an amazing thing. The other day we were talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they were in the furnace. They got thrown into the furnace. You remember that story? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They got thrown into the fiery furnace. It was turned up seven times hotter. And the guards that, that fired up the furnace, they, did, they fell deceased at the doors of the furnace because it was so immensely hot that they dropped dead. And so the scripture says they rolled into the fire. And, the, and then they were in there. And the, although the the ropes that bound them burned off of them. They were dancing around in there. And they, of course, the king says, were there not three men? Now there's four. And one looks like the Son of Man. Amen? Amen? You know what the last thing it says? Is they came out of there, and it didn't smell like smoke. They came out of this furnace that these guys dropped dead on the, on the outside. And it didn't smell like smoke. They didn't smell like smoke. And you know what's an amazing thing? When Lazarus came out of that tomb, he didn't smell like a dead man, did he? Amen? I don't know if you ever smelled the stinky animal on the side of the road that's been hit, been there a few days. I used to work for the city. I can tell you what it smells like. It's awful. <laughs> and the smell lingers, right? I mean, we used to throw them in the trucks. I'm just giving you a little brief testimony. It's awful. It's a horrific experience. Anyway, when the truck would go in the shop, you'd spill the carcass off, and the truck would go in the shop, and the whole shop would smell this way. It's awful. It's a, Gordon's nodding his head. He goes, yeah, I know that one, right? So he comes out of the tomb. He doesn't smell. He doesn't smell. The, the tomb doesn't smell. And, and he says this classic, take off his grave clothes. What's holding him bound? Maybe some of us here need to take off our grave clothes. Amen? You hear what I'm telling you? Maybe we're bound and we don't need to be bound. Maybe we're bound because in our minds we don't realize that the life that we're living, it's not designed for us to live in a temporal manner where, you know, it's from the day you were born to the day that you're, you know, is on your little tombstone. And, you know, and so as a result, you look at it and you think, well, I'm going to be from here to here. I better, you know, you only live once, YOLO. So, you know, I'm going to do my best, right? Instead of, no, 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 you're born in the flesh of your mother and then you live through eternity one way or another and we're going to get to that but to get your mind wrapped around how drastically different understanding that Jesus was victorious over the grave I love that tune where it says he walked out of the grave he, I'm walking too amen if you don't understand that if you if you think that you know you, you were born here you know, and then you're going to die at a certain day and then you're just going to go in the ground and you're going to, maybe you'll be fertilizer for flowers or something. I don't know. And that's where it ends. That's a, a horrible place to be. Because the victory that we have in Christ, <clears throat> the pinnacle, everything that we believe in the Christian faith all boils down to this one truth. Did Jesus come out of the grave? Every other claim that he made, when you, when you, can, you can dissect everything that he said, you know, and people say, 
you know, from different religions of the, the world, they'll say, they'll recognize Jesus and they'll say, well, he was a good teacher. Let me just tell you something. If Jesus was not the Messiah, the son of the living God, then he was a lunatic. Because his claims, his claims are either true or they're not. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Well, they're true. I'm going to just, so I'll just take the disclaimer off lunatic. Because they're true. All right? They're true, but if they were not true, there is no he was a good guy. No, guys like that would be in a padded room somewhere. You hear what I'm telling you? They would be uh, dangerous. But he indeed did come out of the tomb, and he called Lazarus, and Lazarus came out of the tomb. I heard a preacher one time say, he called him by name because every, uh, if he didn't, he, everybody in that tomb would have came out. Because he doesn't... He's not bound by the grave. He's not bound for, by the grave. And, and we're not bound by the grave contingent on we, be, we have this born-again experience, right? We, we have an experience where we become alive in Christ. And as a result, it's not this temporal thing. And, you know, people get so panicked. And, the, the, and they, they're clinging to every little thing because... God forbid somebody passes away, and that's an awful experience, and we all feel a, 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 a void when we lose somebody. But let me just tell you the most wonderful reality that is available to mankind. And it is, it is this. There is a resurrection from the dead. Amen? I mean, if it ended at the grave, listen, I'll weep with you. And, and I've done plenty of funerals, and I've wept at a lot of them. Because I know this reality, there's an offer out there that Jesus made. When he paid that penalty, whoever would call upon his name would be saved. And then that reality means that you don't have to be bound by that grave. And listen, we'll go into that. But the reality of it is, he was identifying who he was before these people. Because they were going to need to know. They were going to need to draw from something. Because when he went into the tomb, when he was taken off of that cross, they had to draw from something. They could draw them. Well, he fed all these people. I watched them cast out demons. I watched him give vision to, to blind people. I watched him to heal these people. I watched all these things. And I watched him call Lazarus out of the grave. You know, this crazy thing is the disciples, many of his followers, they were freaking out in the whole crucifixion thing. They had a hard time realizing that he was purposeful in what happened on the cross. And that's, that's the essence of what I'm, I'm trying to tell you tonight. You know, you guys hear me up here taking a whack at this thing every week. Trying to to bring people to a place that they understand. If you can comprehend the magnitude of the message I'm trying to tell you, these disciples who walked with Jesus didn't get it. They were horrified. He told them he was going to be crucified. Somehow it didn't sink in, and that's what I'm saying is, you can sit under the voice of a preacher, I'm the craziest one you're going to meet. You're going to... Do you have to sit up here? So, all right. So, the point of it is that I'm telling you is we're all trying to bring you to a place that you can grasp a message that says you cannot disregard that Jesus walked out of the tomb on the third day. He, and he ascended to heaven. I've got some other scripture here for you. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. You know, we think, we really think this. We really think that we're living in the land of the living right now. We think we're living in the land of the living. And that we go to the land of the dead. Amen? Amen? But we're living in the land of the dead, and we're going to the land of the living. Because when you're born here on planet Earth, you have an expiration date. Do you hear what I'm telling you? When you're born, 
The doctor gets a hold of you. Yeah. And from that, you have an expiration. You have a shelf life here on Earth. And when you die, it, you go on for eternity. So we've got it backwards. So we're trying to do everything in this little time. And we got it all backwards, and we forget that, no, we're going to the, to the land of the living. It's exactly backwards. God wants us to have a different perspective. He wants us to get this truth, because everything that we believe hinges on this. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, starting in verse 1. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I have received I pass on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried that he raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared first to Cephas and, the, and then to the twelve, that he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me as to one abnormally born. And you know who that is? That's the apostle Paul. Amen. And when he's, he's speaking of abnormally born, the disciples, the disciples Jesus handpicked. And the Apostle Paul, uh, Jesus, he went after as he was a Saul of Tarsus that was condemning Christians and killing Christians. And as a result, uh, Jesus, uh, he had a conversion on the road to Damascus. And, he, and as a result of that, he raised up and he became the mighty Apostle Paul it says, For I am the least of these apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, not, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whenever, when, whether, whenever then... It was, is that I or they, this is what I preached, and this is what you believe. But it is, if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection from the dead? If there is no resurrection from the dead, then even Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we then are to be fall, found false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But if he did not raise him, in fact, from the dead, then we are not raised. And for if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life... We have hope in Christ. We, of all people, are most to be pitied. Listen to this. But Christ has indeed raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection from the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all will be made alive. But each, in turn, Christ the firstfruits, then, when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to destroy is death. For he has put everything under his feet, now then, it says, everything is put under his feet. It is clear that this does not include God himself who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. But you have the big picture here. 
Got this big, big, big picture. And it all hinged on this picture, Jesus rising from the dead. Jesus rising from the dead. Because the whole ball of wax, if you will, hinges on the fact that the penalty of our sin was paid for by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, and there'd be no power to the message if Jesus was still laying in a tomb. Amen? So if you could imagine, if you could imagine, it reminds me of trying to, to take control of something because it's so powerful. Imagine the, the rulers of the day. Jesus is in a tomb, and they were panicked. Every time something would happen with Jesus, they were, they were horrified because it threatened their position as leaders. Jesus would crush who they were publicly by shining a light right into the recesses of their heart and exposing things about them publicly and that they didn't like that at all. But the reality of it is they wanted to do away with Jesus and they thought they believed. Even, even after having to deal with the experience uh, in the garden when they came to arrest Jesus and when he said the words, I am, the ground earthquake and the, and the guards fell off their feet. And so you have this experience and you have some of them and I think many times I think some of the guards had a conversion right there in the garden. Minimally in their mind they knew that something supernatural happened. That the name of Jesus was powerful and that crazy stuff was happening. They knew, they knew that when he gave up his spirit they knew that the, the earth quaked and they knew the supernatural experience that was going on around them and you have to understand they're looking at those things. Some of them completely blinded in denial. Some of the religious leaders looking and probably wondering about this Jesus. When you look at all of the circumstances, when you look at the crucifixion and then Jesus going into the tomb and the religious leaders were so, so uptight over this Jesus, so they said, let's put guards at the tomb. Let's seal the tomb so that we can make sure that nobody can move that stone away. And so if you can imagine, it's heavily guarded, the stone's put in front of it, and it, they're going to stand there and watch guard to make sure the disciples don't come at night and, and pick Jesus up and take him somewhere. So Jesus, his hour comes to rise from the dead. In fulfillment of the scriptures, Jesus gets up. And I've thought about many times him being in that tomb. And Jesus didn't have to roll that stone away to get out. He had to roll the stone away to let the disciples get in. So later we see that he came into the room, in the upper room, he didn't come through the door. Amen? So Jesus, he leaves the tomb. The disciples discover this, this big you know, movement begins. And the religious leaders of the day want to keep it completely hushed. Man, it sounds like our media today, man. You want to just shut something up, just we don't talk about it, just leave it off. Well, it didn't work then. Because the resurrection power of Jesus is alive and well in anybody that would call upon his name. And the scripture says that what he gives us for deposit, deposit, I was just reading it, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where the Spirit of God, he gives us the Holy Spirit as a deposit. And so that we know that we know that we're redeemed. And so our Spirit and the Holy Spirit say amen together. Amen? Amen. If you, if you know what I'm talking about, say amen. All right. So, so we have the benefit of the resurrection of Jesus. He paid the penalty of our sin. 
The scripture says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We receive what he paid for on that cross. The grave couldn't hold him, and it cannot hold us. But everything that we believe, everything we believe is based on did Jesus rise from the dead? And so that's imperative that on our spiritual journey, that when we have, you know, these mile markers, if you will, or watermarks, that we make a place of remembrance, that we hang on to those truths when God works in our lives. Because things get blurry. Things get blurry. As we're traveling on the journey that we travel, we forget the things that are very blatantly true in our life. When we're on the brink of the end of anything that we could possibly hang on to ourselves, we feel like there is no way that we can get past this place. And somehow, somehow God breaks into our world and rescues us. And if you don't understand what that is, if you've never been there, Maybe, maybe you have been there, and maybe things got blurry. Maybe you forgot what it was to be lost, miserably lost, without hope. And you forgot what it is to have a God who loves us like he does, to invade our world and give you truth. So we have to choose in the midst of our circumstances to understand the hindrance for us on this journey as we process things as temporal beings and we're eternal beings. So as a result of that, we look at our lives and we're processing in measurement of the way we think should, things should go based on temporal measurements. And God says, I'm not interested in that at all. You're eternal beings and what you do today matters in eternity. And so the things that he brings us to and the opportunities that he gives us have nothing to do with the here and now as I perceive what I need. So I have to get my mind aligned with reality. I have to get my mind aligned with reality. I have to understand that not everybody who's ever been born on this planet ends up in this place called heaven. That we have a choice to make. The scripture says whoever would call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, right? The Bible says the wages of sin is death, eternal death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The scripture clearly says to who would receive is something you have to receive have the right to become children of God. So we have to come to the place to understand that we're eternal beings living in a temporal body that's going to have an expiration date but's going to continue on. Hello. And so whether I recognize that or not doesn't mean it's not going to affect me. Do you understand what I'm telling you? If I deny the fact that I'm an eternal being, and I just say, I'm going to live this life, YOLO! And I'm just going to, you're going to find out that YOLO is dumb dumb because, no, you don't only live once. D.L. Moody said it like this. He said, the person that's born once dies twice, and the person that's born twice dies once. We go, we live on, and only, only this this experience outside of Christ is not an eternal heaven. It's not this, this journey that we look forward to. It's something that we dread. It's something that when we, when, when we come to the end of things are getting, you know, to the end of our road, we start to think of life with all these regrets. Instead of living in a way that's eternal, that instead of having all these regrets, I start saying, you know what, God, I've made a bunch of mistakes in life till this day, but from this day forward, I'm going to adjust my thinking from temporal to eternal. I'm going to start to act like I've got some sense, and I'm going to take the scriptures for what they are. It boils down to this. What are you going to do with this Jesus? 
because you can't have a casual approach to them. But there is no casual approach. Otherwise, you're just fumbling around. And as you fumble around, this confusion in life goes on and on and on and on and on and on and on. And we make these choices that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to live for Jesus. I'm not going to live for Jesus. I, you know, I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I believe he rose from the dead. I don't know if he rose from the dead. I don't know what the significance of all that is. I don't get it. And as a result, of, we're double-minded. And the Bible says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So you've got to come down on one side of the fence. You've got to say, what do I believe about this Jesus? Do I believe there's a significance? Do I believe there's a significance in the fact that Jesus, having close friends, Lazarus, Mary, and Martha, he allowed Lazarus to die intentionally so they could get a hold of a truth that the grave didn't have a hold of him. And it doesn't have to have a hold of us either. You hear me? And that radically changes who we are. It radically changes who we are. The, to understand anything that we can live for that's temporal is complete foolishness. Complete foolishness. I was just reading the scripture that said, you know, I've got all these crops and I, you know I've got these barns and you know I'm going to tear them down I'm going to put new barns up so that I can eat and drink and be merry and the scripture says you fool your very soul will be required of you today then who will spend what you have worked for where I'm going with this is to say that there's power in the name of Jesus and the reason there's power in the name of Jesus is because he paid the price of our sin on a cross, but he was on a mission. And that cross led him to a grave, and the grave led him to walking out of there victorious over it. And there's a lesson there tonight for us now. In the same way that Mary and Martha and those who were, were mourning were there and they seen Lazarus walk forth, that here tonight, that we can make a choice to understand that our life can radically be changed because Jesus came out of the tomb on the third day. And because that radically changes us, that changes the makeup of everything that we're about, it means that we don't have to be worried about this existence after death. But it does mean that in the meantime, that anybody that walks this planet around us has an opportunity for us to be agents of Christ to tell others about what we have found. Which means I can't be on two teams at the same time. You hear what I'm telling you? I, can't, I have to know who I am. I have to understand I'm, I'm an eternal being in a temporal world of people around me that are, that are headed toward hell. And they don't know it. And as a result, in the pursuit of the things that are temporal, what happens? Well, in the pursuit of the things that are temporal, end up all the snags of the world that we get all tangled up in. Hello. Do you hear what I'm telling you? All the snags, all the things that are out there that we want to stay away from, you know what? Here's it in a nutshell. Is the reason that we do things the way we do here, that I have meetings every single morning with people, and they're called devotions, because you know what? Because... What we're doing is we're programming our mind to think in eternal fashion. Which means the snags and the snares that would befall me when I'm living temporally are gone because I'm no, they don't have a hold on us anymore. It's just like Lazarus got the opportunity of hearing out of the words of Jesus, take off those grave clothes. You don't need them anymore. Amen? Amen. Well, I don't know where you're at tonight. I don't know what journey of life you found yourself on. I don't know if you, you know, came through the door here tonight, and maybe you're, you're, maybe for you, maybe the grave for you means it is the end as you know it here, and there is no hope for you because you don't understand that Jesus died on a cross to pay the penalty of your sin. And if that's the case, you need to receive that right now. I always give an invitation at the end of a service, and the reason is so you can respond to what you just heard. 
But if you have asked the Lord to save you, if you've done that, if you've been at a place that you said, came to the end of yourself and you said, God, I want what Jesus did on that cross to count for me. But I don't want to just have it just because I, I get a, a get out of hell free card. But I want a new life in Christ that's not focused on temporal things, that's focused on eternal things. That changes, that turns the corner in my life to say the things that were on the table for me are no longer there. And you're hearing something here tonight. You're saying, you know what? I'm in the temple lane. I'm a person that's asked God to forgive me through the blood of his son, but I am in the temple lane and that's what I live for. Well, you need to do something about that. You need to do something about it. We do it by... Counselors, would you come forward? We do it like this. We do something publicly because that's how Jesus called people out publicly. He called them out publicly because you're out there in front of God and everybody else. Then you have to come to terms with what kind of a commitment you're going to make. If you're going to go down the roads of life and you want to stay on the same ones you are, that you're on when you came in the door, stay right in your seat. But if you would say you've heard something here tonight and you think that maybe, just maybe, the resurrected Jesus wants to do something in your life, you want to change your course, then get up out of your seat and come up and we're going to pray with you. We're going to talk about what it looks like to do that. Because every one of us up there, guess what we had to do? We had to come to a place that we came to the end of ourselves, and we said, we don't have the answer. He does. And the reason we don't have the answer is because we had temporal thinking. And Jesus is eternal. As the music plays, would you respond?
Thank you for this time. God, I pray you would help us as we go from this place. Help us to walk in the victory that's already been won. Pray you would receive the glory. God, just in the attitudes of our heart as we respond to you, be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.